I think things like page views, search rank, keyword rank are sort of your means to an end. Like, yeah, you track them, but like, nah, you really focus on other things. The North Star that I like to focus on is whether that content meets two or more stakeholder goals. You can identify that as a quick or short-term win while also seeing the foundation it creates for long-term success. This is The Anonymous Marketer, a podcast where we tackle the biggest questions from the B2B marketing community. But instead of bringing on guests for a quick chat, every question comes from an anonymous source. These are the questions B2B marketers have but are afraid to ask. Let's start the conversation. Hey, I'm Nick Bennett. And I'm excited to get into this episode and dive into some of the new anonymous questions that we received. But before we get into it, I wanted to do my part and highlight our supporters. If you're a marketer, it's likely you have attribution data spread across spreadsheets, your CRM, your marketing automation platform, and other places. With data all over the place, it's hard to understand what drives the highest quality leads. And that's why I want to tell you about Hockey Stack. After adding one single line of code to your website, HockeyStack gives your company the ability to turn your marketing, sales, revenue, and product data into a unified picture. HockeyStack provides the analytics and attribution data your B2B company actually deserves. Get a free trial, and in five minutes, you can start using the product. Sign up today at HockeyStack.com. Hey, I'm Nick Bennett. I'm excited to get into this episode and go through some new anonymous questions. But before we get into it, I wanted to do my part and highlight our supporters. As marketers, we want to create content that enables our sales team to win deals. But 70% of the content that we create for sales never gets used. It's a waste of time and energy. But it doesn't have to be this way. And that's why you should know about Alego. Alego is an all-in-one sales enablement platform designed to help revenue teams reach their full potential. Alego makes it easy for sellers to share content in the field with the right context. And it helps drive sales and marketing alignment. It increases collaboration. It optimizes messaging. And more importantly, it gets you more closed one deals. To learn more, visit alego.com. In fact, the average employee sends around 10,000 emails per year. That means a company with 100 employees sends over 1 million emails annually. That's 1 million missed opportunities to showcase your brand, grow your funnel, and close more deals. OpenSense turns every employee email into a beautifully branded target ad channel that returns 4 to 7% CTR on average. Now, the best part, it's one simple platform to manage email signatures, promote upcoming events, distribute content, and more on Outlook and Gmail. No manual work, no tedious targeting, just better campaigns all at scale. Sign up for a demo at opensense.com and get 10% off today. As a tech marketer, do you know which paid media platform brings in the highest ROI? If you don't know which platform sets you up for faster, more cost-efficient growth, then you're skipping the first step to securing more customers. You won't be able to attract, convert, and retain customers to ramp up revenue. That's why Directive developed The Verdict, a game-changing benchmark and data report from the Performance Marketing Agency for Tech Brands. In this report, you'll discover which paid media platforms bring in the highest ROI so you can optimize your sales and marketing strategies. The Verdict report gives you valuable insights from over $150 million in ad spend from the top paid media platforms used for tech companies, platforms like Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, Bing, and Captera. The report dives deep into key metrics from lead to customer for each platform and shares powerful strategies for how you can generate the greatest ROI for your tech company. You'll also learn about how Directive views the difference between marketing qualified leads, sales qualified leads, opportunity metrics, and customer acquisition costs. Don't only rely on your company's data of one. Take advantage of industry-wide insights to truly understand the paid media trends that impact your bottom line. Check out The Verdict today at directiveconsulting.com slash Nick. What's up, everyone, and welcome back to The Anonymous Marketer. I'm your host, Nick Bennett, and today we are going to explore a question around content creation at early stage companies, one lots of marketers, I'm sure, face today. I have no one better 
Then the lovely Amanda Natividad, who is the VP of Marketing at SparkToro. She is an absolute gem. Amanda, thank you so much for joining me. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Nick. And thank you for that beautiful introduction. Absolutely. So to get started, let's, let's talk about how we got the question that was submitted today. So the question came from our website. If you want to submit a question for the show, go over to motionagency.io slash anonymous. You'll see a form where you can submit your most pressing question. Nothing's off the table. Amanda, I knew you'd provide an interesting perspective on these questions specifically. So I want to jump into this first question. And for anyone that's listening, a couple things to keep in mind with this anonymous source. This person works at a small MarTech company. So I mean, I can kind of relate to this. They work on a marketing team of two people. So my, I wonder if it's like a VP or marketing and like a individual contributor or something. But the question is, how would you approach content creation at a Series A or B startup? If I'm a one-person marketing team with an annual budget of 75K, what's the best way to approach my content strategy? So Amanda, let's take this question into two parts because I think it's kind of, it's a heavy question. Let's focus on the first part of the question, which is around the approach of the strategy for content at a Series A or B startup. So if this is a Series A or B, the company may still be trying to lock down their ideal customer, their own messaging. What's the first step that you would take with a content strategy at this company? Yeah, so hmm. but this was kind of funny, though. It was like early stage company, small MarTech startup, two people on the marketing team. I was like, did I write this question? <laughs> Is that me? <laughs> no, I did not write the question. All right. So I, that said, I am in a very similar position. SparkToro is a three-person company, but the marketing team is essentially myself and Rand Fishkin. We do have some outside help at given times for certain projects. Like when we you know, redid our onboarding process, we contracted people like Gia Laudi and Claire Solentrop at Forget the Funnel, as well as Ramley John who helped us redo our onboarding sequences. So we do have some help at times. But to answer the question, how would I go about thinking about this? So I guess I would think about this in like in a couple of ways. First, on the personal level, I would think about what am I, what am I, Amanda? Like what am I best at? What am I really good at? And like where do I shine? And then what are the other areas that I think are going to be good for the business that I'm not as good at, right? Like we shouldn't do all the things all the time. And especially if we're at an early stage startup where it feels tempting to try everything because you're like, we're still early. We got to, we got to test it all. You, you could, but the downsides to that are to get some meaningful results or data on those tests, you have to run them at scale. And to run them at scale, you got to do them for a long time. And then that's going to burn you out. Like, it's just not a great thing to do. Test fewer things. But think about, like, what are you best at? What are you good at? So, so that you can kind of focus on doing that work, like doing that tactical work. If you're a great writer, maybe focus on the blog. If you're a good extemporaneous speaker, maybe it's a good time to, like, host a podcast or YouTube channel and, like, focus on that. Meanwhile, the other things that are good for the business that you're less good at, but you know are important, hopefully you have budget to hire for that. And maybe you can hire like a really experienced consultant who can be a pretty tactical doer who will like, do the work versus point you in the direction of doing things. Like hopefully they would actually do it. So hopefully some consultants, freelancers, small agencies can maybe help, maybe be helpful depending on your budget. So that's the individual level on a company level, right? Like then I would think about what are the main levers of growth or what is the lever of growth in this company and how can I set that up for long-term success while identifying some short-term quick wins? So thinking about, okay, the main levers of growth, what are they? Are we a sales-led organization in which we have a sales team and like BDRs and everybody who, you know, close deals? Or are we more of a product led company where, you know, it's like a, we sell MarTech tool, maybe it's a hundred bucks a month or 50 bucks a month where it's not super expensive, right? Like it's not for an individual. Sure. That's expensive. 
But if it's for a company that has some marketing budget, that's not a lot of money. So, right, so you're probably not going to have a sales team for that kind of price point and that kind of offering. And then, of course, you have like kind of paid growth companies, like companies that are, you know, they it, it's a better fit for them to focus on e-commerce ads like Google ads, Facebook ads, so on and so forth. And then there's also you could think about if you're if your company is powered essentially by word of mouth or community. I'm sure there are more, <laughs> but those are some of the four the four like key areas that I focus on. Yeah. And you can read about more of this on Julian Shapiro's startup guide. I think it's on his I think it's on julian.com, but that's a good like starting point for understanding what are the main levers of growth in a given com- company. And then from there, think about how your content can power each of those things. Yeah, I love that. That's oh, honestly, it, it's so good. And it, it's such a, it's such a tough thing because I've also worked for a few Series A companies that have moved from Series A to Series B. I mean, I'm not typically a, in the content roles, but I feel like, you know, sometimes when you're in an early stage startup, it's like you're wearing so many different hats as is. But one thing that we can't deny is customers and customers are important. And I think factoring in customer research to an early stage company, I guess my question would be, what role does customer research play in like the early stages of a content strategy? Yeah. So when I started doing content marketing, I didn't know SEO. Like I learned SEO or at least, you know, the basics of it a little bit later in content marketing because I was more focused on the the business needs side and like the marketing, overall marketing needs. I'm not saying that SEOs are not aware. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I, I wasn't thinking about it in that way. And instead, what I thought about mostly was customer research, audience research. Like, what are the things that my customers care about? What are the problems they're facing? Why are people churning? And then a little bit more broadly, audience research, right? Like, where is my audience already paying attention? What are the, you know, what are the publications they read? What are the social accounts they follow? Which podcasts do they listen to? Which subreddits do they lurk in? Those, you know, that part of audience research. And and in focusing on those things, I felt like it was easier to create content that resonated with our audience. Because then I was consuming what they were consuming and really being in their shoes and seeing the world through their eyes. And then I was thinking a little bit less about like, well, what are the high volume search terms and more about what are the problems that they're facing today that they might not be searching for? Like if you're facing a given problem at work, you might not be Googling it. right? I mean, maybe you are. I don't know. It depends on what it is. Right. But like it doesn't always mean that you're searching for it online. It could just be a thing that is like sticking in your head that you just haven't externalized in any way. So like those are kind of the things that I was like, interested in trying to pursue. So that's where I think customer audience research fits in, right? You you can have like the keyword research aspect that gives you that starting point of like, okay, in my industry, what are some common topics people are searching for? I'm not saying that's not helpful. Of course, it can be really helpful. But you can use customer research and audience research to help you to help guide you in the direction of here's why they're searching for these things. Here's what here's what they actually care about. Here are the implications of that search, right? Like if you you can uncover that like, you know, marketing strategy as a keyword search term, like that gets like tens of thousands of searches per month. But that doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you like just because you're a MarTech tool, you should do a post on marketing strategy. Like you don't like it doesn't. I mean, like, sure, your audience is probably thinking about it. But but like, then what? what? What do you do with that information? Right. Like more useful is to think about the core problems that your product solves and how you can kind of use broader ideas or broader problems to to connect with your customers. I love that. I mean, honestly, for me, I've always talked to customers. I've always done customer research. I think it's incredibly important in honestly any role that you're in because I mean, yeah, content definitely makes sense. But even for me with a field marketing ABM kind of background, it's like, you know, still those customers determine like, what does that like event strategy look like? Or how do you put the customer first or the prospect first or attendee first in everything that you do? So I, I, I agree with you there. 
You talked about SEO. And so I think the question is, how do you actually figure out what to produce? Like, are you determining if SEO is a good route to take? Do you even care about SEO in early stages? I mean, you talked about it a little bit. Is it more about sales enablement? Like, what would you say is the plan there? I do think it's important for most companies to think about SEO pretty early on. I think there are exceptions to any rule, but where it's important is it takes such a long time to really to really see the tangible benefits of SEO, of that organic traffic coming in. And it's always going to be something that if you don't do, you're always going to be like, oh, why didn't we do that last year? Right. So it's kind of something you want to. I don't want to say set and forget, but I want to say like put into place and work on while not expecting immediate results. So not forget. <laughs> yeah. Don't ex- set it and don't expect. Maybe it's that. <laughs> but you, there are ways to do this that like aren't bandwidth heavy, right? Like it doesn't mean you have to hire an SEO agency and pay them 10 grand a month for like nothing, right? Or, or not nothing, but like for results you're not going to see for a while. I think what you can do is work with an SEO consultant to help you make sure that your website's set up correctly. So maybe like a technical SEO. And then you yourself can like get an Ahrefs or like Moz or SEMrush subscription and identify the high volume keywords in your niche. Figure out like maybe what are some of the like medium tier, tier keywords and stuff. Like getting that lay of the land of your niche or industry. And like these research tools don't cost that much, right? And then from there, like you could think of it, it kind of just depends, right? Like maybe depends on your budget, appetite for writing, appetite for spending and keyword difficulty. And you might decide like, okay, like I don't, there actually are some high volume, maybe high volume could be even just like 500 searches per month. It doesn't have to be like tens of thousands. Okay. There are some high volume search terms are niche kind of low difficulty score like we might as well try to go after these and try to get some of these blog posts out and then focus on doing maybe like one or two posts a week hopefully you know if you can hire someone to help you with some of this stuff you can and then just kind of track that over time and i think if i think the the bar for this is relatively low in the sense that if you're going after low difficulty keywords and you're and you know like look go to go to the top ranking the top three content pieces that rank for this term and like read through them and like understand like okay what am i what's my competition here what am i up against what do i have to write about and then just try to write a better blog post like try to make sure it covers all the information plus maybe more i don't know and then what i've seen and i've and i've and i've done this for like a blog that wasn't very good and i this was one of my own side projects and in doing this, like, I just went after, like, I think I only went after, like, a handful of keywords. So it's a it's a site with very few blog posts, but was able to see some traffic trickle in within three months. So you can see some stuff happening pretty early on. Sure, you're not going to know, oh, this drove, like, this many sales. But if you're going to see that traffic trickle in, like, you're not going to be disappointed. So try to get some of that in motion while you work on really meaningful stuff. Right. So like if you have some sales enablement content to work on, that's going to be super high value. Right. Like maybe you maybe your time is going to be really well spent spending like 12 hours in a given week working on a really good like pitch deck for your sales team. Like that's going to be worth it. Right. Get some of that SEO stuff working in the background, but focus like a lot of your time and energy on the things that, you know, are going to be high ROI. Yeah, 100 percent. I actually, you know, funny enough, like I was actually running an enablement session for our sales team today. And I mean, for us, we're a MarTech platform. And so I am the buyer of tech like this, of what we sell. And so I kind of walk through like a little bit of persona work, but also, you know, hey, like as salespeople, these are the the terms that, you know, field marketers and event marketers use, things like that. And just kind of it was it was so high value and the amount of people that were like, hey, like this was really, really helpful. And fortunately, we had a lot of blog content that went with it that ranked really high that focused on like the intent piece and like what does event led growth actually mean? Because so many people like, oh, great, it's just another like LG, like 
there's PLG, there's all these LGs. Now you're saying like event led growth. What does that even mean? And so like I was trying to run an enablement session for the sales team and like just showcase to them that, hey, as a marketer, these are the things that actually matter. And these are the things that I look at. And there was just, it was definitely like high value there. So Wait, that's fun. super interesting. Tell me more about event led growth. Yeah. I mean, ultimately it's putting the attendee at the center of everything. So, so many times companies think of a company first, go to market, but you need to flip your mindset and think of a people first, go to market. So like the people inform your go to market. It's like the person is behind that ebook. So say you write an ebook or a company puts out an ebook. Most of the times there's no author of that ebook, but there's an actual person that probably wrote that. Why not highlight that individual? Why not in your events, highlight the content and the speakers and the experience for the individual based on data that you know they actually care about? I mean, you talked about audience research, like that's very similar to events. Like you can use research to inform the types of events and like activations that you do, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I, I say that too, as like someone who like runs events and our office hour sessions are a huge driver of growth for us, or at least like retention, brand awareness, excitement. And like to that point, we, you know, over time, we've seen like repeat attendees come back. And now it just kind of feels like this cool, commu like decentralized community, right? Where people are just coming back to the water cooler, hanging out. And it was something that like, because we saw such good engagement in our live chat and just um, seeing the social media chatter, that was what gave way to our virtual summit, Spark Together. We're running it again this this fall. But just wanted to point out, like, just with, with event-led growth, like, you can uncover other opportunities for different kinds of events. And I think especially if you have, like, if you have a strong strategy or, like, strong goals for what a given event does – then that makes it clear what the other events should, how they should be or what they should do. Exactly. It shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be yeah. part of a strategy. And so many people think of events. I mean, trust me, I've done thousands of events. It's just what my background is. And like so many people think of an event as like a lead gen driver or a brand awareness, but they think of it as an afterthought. And you should really think about it as part of like your go-to-market strategy because events move the needle. I mean, we, I mean, we do like 20 something events per quarter, but like I can tell you, we drive millions of dollars in pipeline mm -hmm. that come from these and it's all virtual. So, I mean, ultimately outside of time, it's, it's zero cost for us. So, yeah, totally. And, you, and you've run a lot of very different kinds of events too, right? Like you've, you've done things like smaller, like mixers where like, okay, hey, that's different. Like that's, that's going to be a super different event from like a conference, obviously, or like a morning round table. Exactly. Lots of examples we can yep. yeah hundred percent. I mean, ultimately, you have to know what your outcome, like what are the outcomes you're looking to achieve are. And I think it goes back to even like this question. It's like, what's the outcomes that you ultimately want to achieve? And I think before I get before we get into the second piece of the question, I want to kind of like end it with this piece. Is like, what are the common mistakes startups at this stage make when it comes to content creation, and how can they be avoided with early stage companies? Like, what are I guess you know if you could give couple bullet points as far as like tactical advice what, what would you say i would say a common mistake i see people make is i don't think you have to fully like deeply understand seo in order to hire for it and in order to reap the benefits from it and a, and a common mistake i see is that it's still like it, there's, there's a lot to learn about seo right so people think like oh this is really hard and i can't do it I have to hire some expensive agency and like we're just going to bite the bullet and spend 100K this year on SEO. And that's going to be how it is. I don't think you need to do that. And I think when people do, it's because they don't trust themselves enough. They're like, oh, we got to just hire for this. And like ah, most agencies are not going to disqualify themselves from the process. Like <laughs> they're, I don't know if there are a lot of agencies that would say like, yeah, you don't need us. Like, we'll just do the Most of them are, you know, whatever, separate point. But I think like the mistake is that people think I have to spend all this money and then sometimes they do and then they're not happy with it because they're like, dude, I spent a hundred thousand dollars. Like, why isn't, why aren't things happening? It's month three, it's month four. And I get it. That's, that is an expensive bullet to bite for ROI that you're not going to see right away. 
So I would say that's why I say like maybe hire a technical SEO to do like some of the foundational work for you. And like, sure, like find a great person and pay them well, but like have it be like a one time thing. And then from there, identify some short term wins that everybody agrees upon. That's a really big thing. Like what you can't do is like hire for SEO and then be like, all right, it's good. We'll just we'll check in next year. Because someone's gonna, someone in that chain is going to get pissed off and be like, what happened to this? Why did we spend so much money? And the quick wins need to be things that the whole team agrees on across marketing and up, right? It needs to be something like, okay, can you guarantee we're going to get like 500 leads this quarter or something like that, right? Something that everybody can kind of work to together so that you know everybody's on track, you know something meaningful is happening. And you can also be held accountable, right? That way you can be held accountable to the things that you should be doing. Yeah, 100%. We actually do this thing called a V2 mom. And basically, it's kind of like we have a, like each team within marketing has like, all right, cool. These are the agreed upon metrics and KPIs that we're going to look at. So the event team has one, social media has one, demand gen product, content, et cetera. And so like, there's pacing within there. So as a team, we can all hold each other accountable. So week over week, we know, all right, to blog post, we expect this much traffic. For SEO, we expect this. For downloads, we expect this. For event registration or pipeline, we expect this. And so like, it's a way for not only the marketing team to hold each other accountable, but the entire organization from a visibility standpoint to hold each other accountable. And it's the first time I've ever used this model. I've done different types of things, but it's actually quite interesting to like see how other functions within marketing think about what's important and then like how they all track that. Yeah, totally. Couldn't agree more. Cool. So digging into the second part of the question, which is a bit more specific, and it gives us some parameters to work from. So this person says, you know, they have a 75K annual budget for content specifically. Mm -hmm. So like, how would you prioritize spending, say, 75K for an annual budget for content strategy specifically? Yeah. So I would, I think that's a pretty good, I think that's a great budget to start with for sure. I would, I would take a little bit of that and earmark that for a good technical SEO consultant. I'd want to make sure that that consultant is somebody who, yeah, sure, can provide some like, strategy advice, but also do some of the work. And by do some of the work, I mean, like, can they actually talk to our engineers on, like, the thing that needs to get fixed or done? Like, can that actually work? So that would require good alignment with, you know, the, the, the engineering team or the web development team on ensuring, like, hey, you guys are going to help support, right? <laughs> that would want to make sure that I get like references, testimonials about this consultant because I don't want to get burned. And maybe I would assume that this person is going to work with us for like a month and maybe it'll be like hopefully under $10,000. That's the hope. Uh, and then I think that's reasonable for a month of work yeah. or, you know, a month to two months, however long it needs to be. But I would put a finite timeline on it. And that would be something that's like, this better work, right? Like, I want this foundational, this foundation to be strong. Then I would use, I would use some of the budget for the tools that I need most. So probably what I would do is then get a keyword research tool, at least for, the, for a month, to do some keyword research and export some of those lists and have them. I don't know if I'm going to use these ongoing, so I probably cancel after a month. And then I would assuming, and I don't know if I will, right? Assuming I do some kind of like SEO blog strategy, I'd also want to get a clear scope subscription to make sure that my, the, the quality of my content with respect to keyword rank is high. Like clear scope is a pretty amazing tool that can help you do this. And I'd try to make sure all the content is like A plus before I publish it. And then again, depending on like what, what the main areas of focus are, I would hire for what I need. Like if I, if, if it, again, if it's an SEO driven blog, I'd try to hire maybe at least one good freelance writer to help me with some of the work, with some of the, the blog post publishing. If the play is doing like a podcast, getting some good audio clips and some video, then I'm going to look for a really good like boutique agency or like two person team to help me with that. 
you know, I know podcasting is expensive, so I'm going to, and like per and like well, this is me personally. I don't have the patience to learn how to edit audio and stuff. If I did, that'd be great, but I don't. So that's the thing I would hire for. And then I would focus most of my energy on doing the things that I'm best at, which I think are writing for a blog and writing for social media. That's what I would focus on. And then along the way, I would think about like, I don't know how I would spend all that money, but I would think of the things that I would be considering. So this is money for content. Yep. So I would think about like, are there content partnerships that are worth paying for? Like, I would never pay for like link building, but like, are there sponsorships that are related to content that are worth pursuing? I would look into those kinds of things. So, yeah. I love that. Well, you actually kind of bring me to like the other piece that I was going to ask you about because I know you, you've talked about partnerships or co-marketing a bit in your content. So like, could you dig a little deeper? Like what, what role would that play in say a 75K budget? Like how could you maximize the ROI from like a partnership or co-marketing perspective? Yeah. So one one idea that comes to mind is doing some kind of a sponsorship with a marketing creator, a marketing influencer. Yeah. So somebody like, you know, like Alex Garcia at Marketing, at marketing Examined. Like, could we partner on some like not branded content but con that like could we partner on like a case study in which like he does a deep dive into my product and like writes about it for marketing examined like that would be something that's like maybe that's worth pursuing right like that would be content that's created that we can that we can amplify that we can use in some proof points throughout like sales decks or things like that 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 ultimately becomes source content that we cite in other things. So that's kind of how I would think about that. And I think that's a little bit of an underrated play in influencer marketing. And I'm saying influencer marketing very generally, right? Because you have like, you know, the people with like a million followers that are super expensive to work with. And you have people like micro influencers who have like 10,000 followers who are super impactful and influential, but just it's different. But I think the underrated kind of opportunity is in using their content that they've published for you. And of course you have to be like, you have to be strategic and truly above board like if they're going to tweet about you you definitely have to make sure you get their permission to promote that tweet. But in that case does that promotional tweet does that go into the content into the content budget? Like that's where maybe it depends, right? If the call to action is like download this white paper, probably if it's by the product, probably not. But I think there is enough overlap where it's worth having that conversation and thinking about how that comes out of a content budget. I love that you mentioned that because, I mean, I've done a lot in my career, but like everything that I'm passionate about right now is the creator economy in B2B. And I've been doing a lot of talks recently on influencer marketing 2.0, at least that's what I'm calling it. It's very much an integrated strategy versus like, the brand telling the influencer or creator what to do because it's always been so very one-sided. And I think of B2C, they've done this really well, but B2B is lacking. And I'm writing a book on this right now. It's like the, the creator economy and B2B because there's so many people that want to leverage creators and influencers that fall pretty much in like that 25K to 75K following on say like LinkedIn, for example. And they just don't know how to get started. I, I, I did a talk yesterday and they were just like, they were like, I want to do this, but one, I don't know how to find these people to partner with. How do I approach them? Like, what kind of content do I promote? Do I promote a research report? Do I promote an ebook? Do I promote the company? And so, like, I think there's so much, like, we should talk about that again down the road because, like, I think there's so much there that is, like, so interesting to me. And we're very much at the very early stages of, like, the early adopters, at least in MarTech and sales tech, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. Cool. So the last thing that I want to ask you before we wrap everything up is, and I want to use this as a way to kind of like connect the dots be between everything. How should a one person marketing team measure and track the success of their content strategy? So I, I think things like page views, search rank, keyword rank are sort of your means to an end. Like, yeah, you track them, but like, eh, you really focus on other things. 
the North Star that I like to focus on is whether that content meets two or more stakeholder goals. You can identify that as a quick or short-term win while also seeing the foundation it creates for long-term success. So if a given piece of content, like some kind of tutorial or how-to, right, maybe that powers customer success or customer marketing, product marketing, lifecycle marketing, and it maybe, maybe it gives way to some email campaigns. Maybe there's an SEO element to it where it's tied to a high volume search term, right? Like those are things that show that the content is playing a role in other areas of the business. And it's showing that you, or you can really see the ROI a lot faster. So that's always been something that I've focused on, two or more stakeholder goals. That's how you know, like it's going to be at least, it's going to clear at least some kind of bar for quality inevitably, <laughs> because in order to be useful across multiple functions, it just will. And yeah. That's, it's honest, honestly, I feel like everything was like, for me, again, like I said, I don't have a content background. So like, this is super informative for me because I feel like I've like dabbled. I mean, I've, I don't know, I guess you could say I'm a content creator, but like, I'm not a content marketer. And I feel like they are different to a certain degree. But, you know, honestly, you, you left everyone with so much information. I think it was great. So I want to give, you know, you a little bit of time here. Where can people go to find you? They have questions, anything that you want to promote, feel free because you are, like I said, you're, you're a gem. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. I mean, you can follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram as Amanda Nat. And I'm still early to Instagram, so you can go there and make fun of me and like laugh at the cringe things I'm doing. I also have a, at this point, monthly or so newsletter at amandanat.com. And then, of course, check us out at SparkToro for our audience research tools. We also have our audience research newsletter. If you Google audience research newsletter, you'll find it. But yeah, check us out. Love that. Awesome. And anyone that is listening, please, if you have any anonymous questions, head over to motionagency.io slash anonymous. Submit your questions. We are getting through the 60 to 70 that we have. It's only a biweekly show, so it's going to take me a little while. But so appreciative, Amanda. Thank you again. And for everyone else, we will catch you on the next episode. See y'all later. Thanks for checking out this episode of The Anonymous Marketer. For more episodes, check us out wherever you get your favorite podcasts or visit us on the web at motionagency.io slash anonymous. And finally, this show is produced by Motion, a done-for-you podcast agency for small, scrappy B2B tech marketers. To learn how you can launch and grow a podcast for your company, visit motionagency.io.